Hello, hello. This is your Thursday movie talk, and we are talking about some Avengers Endgame fake endings that they shot. On top of that, a Hawkeye series was announced, and oh my, we have a Star Wars celebration preview coming your way right now because a lot of us are packing up and taking off. In fact, at this time, right now, while you're watching movie talk, we might be in Chicago. <laughs> Things are crazy, and I am so excited to, one, welcome John Roca back to the show. Hello. But we have the one and only Pete Escaretta from Slash Film here. Thank you. How Thank are you, you doing? Me. I am so excited to for this celebration, even though I'm not going. That's but crazy. I know. This is the first one I've missed since Disney bought Lucasfilm. So I, I am but I'm gonna be at my I'm gonna be glued to my computer, like watching the updates, watching your updates and I've uh, we have two writers from the site who live in Chicago and so it made no <laughs> financial sense to send me. Oh no, boy. No. All right. Well, you can still watch from afar. I know they're live streaming a lot of the panels. So everyone out there, whether yeah. you're in Chicago or not, you are going to get a taste of Star Wars Celebration. And that is part of the reason why we're diving into it right now. We're going to preview some of what we've got coming up, what we're planning to see, what we hope to see. So the big ones that you probably know of, the big presentations there, we have the Star Wars Episode Nine panel. And then in addition, we've got the Mandalorian panel. On top of that, there's Galaxy. Galaxy's Edge, that's the uh, the Disney park that's opening up fairly soon now. We also have Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and the Vader Immortal VR series as well. So, oh man, Peter, do you want to kick it off for us? Uh, first off, let's start with the Episode 9 panel. What do you realistically think we're going to get from that? I think we're going to get the first trailer. We're going to get the first title. We're going to get the title. We don't even know the title of this movie, and we're going to get the trailer, uh, <laughs> what, tomorrow. And that, that, that is insane to me. Uh, and I, I, I've heard some things about this trailer, guys and uh, guys and gal. Um, <laughs> And I think this trailer is going to kind of divide. Like, there's going to be some hints at some oh, stuff that no. might divide Star Wars fandom. I think, it, but it's exciting. I think it's exciting. Oh wow! I would be so surprised if that was the reaction. <laughs> well, given the response to Last Jedi, I thought that yeah. at least at the very beginning of the promotional campaign. I'm not saying that JJ is going to keep it safe from start to finish in the final feature, but I did think that they were going to come right out the gate with a major crowd pleaser across the board. I'm not saying it's not going to be a crowd pleaser, but I think the, the, okay. I think JJ. From what I understand, J.J. is not taking the responsibility of this ending this trilogy. He's trying to end the whole saga as a whole. Right. And to bring that full circle, you need to do some things. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be interesting. You'll, you'll see. Tomorrow. Okay. So trailer, title, do you add anything else to that list, Roka? Uh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Emperor Palpatine, <laughs> Luke, what are we getting? Now I'm all excited. No, I, I think also we'll find out maybe some of the new cast members mm -hmm. or the new act, characters that will be in uh, episode nine. Maybe we'll get some of that. Maybe there'll be hints to uh, the red stormtroopers that they were alluded to possibly. There's a lot of things I think that you can play around with in episode nine to bring out and march out. And who knows? I don't know if is Hamill going to be there. Who's going to be there. Obviously, the main actors will be there, but like, who else is going to show up to be a bit of a surprise? I look forward to that. And I don't know how much plot synopsis we'll get either, so that'll be interesting to see how much we'll get out of this panel. I want to know everything. I right? want to know everything, but I want a level of secrecy, so nothing spoiled. But I am assuming we're going to get something along the lines of what we got at the last Star Wars celebration, mm. which was the reveal of certain characters, right. stills of them, you know, basically the bullet point, who are they? And I'm assuming that's going to be a big thing with Carrie Russell's character who I am just absolutely dying to know more about at this She's point. She's like in a whole mask and outfit. And I, I think if you look back at the original teaser trailer for Force Awakens, it, there was just these images that made us ask questions. Mm -hmm. It's J.J. Abrams. We're going to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this is going to do. It's going to show us some interesting imagery that's going to... Uh, have us speculate. The Force Awakens teaser trailer still to this day is one of my favorites of all time. I mean, what was it? Like a handful, like maybe a dozen shots, but every single one of them was one on on its own, beautiful, but also made you speculate about a million and one things. Yeah, there's like there's like maybe five instances in my entire life that I can remember being, ex being knowing exactly where I was when I watched a trailer. And this Force Awakens trailer, I remember yeah. being in my bedroom, I had to leave in an hour to go to San Diego. I remember being in my bedroom and and that and just you know closing all the windows and just watching that trailer and the first time it came on and then over and over and over again and texting with people who were there back and forth about what it was like to be there and hearing it and watching it for the first time and just hearing hearing Han and everything you're just like your mind just goes insane so I hope something like that happens as well in this situation uh, when you see the trailer were you there for the last Jedi trailer reaction I was, no, I was uh, not there for I last mean Jedi neither trailer. was I and I'm yeah. a little jealous that's hands down one of the greatest trailer reactions we've ever done 
done. Yeah. So it was on our way back. Oh from wait, New- no, yes, well, I was I in the air. You were in that. That's yeah. right. I remember we were that on we were our coming way back, back from, from New York, York Comic Con, yeah. and thirty thousand right. feet. They all using the little JetBlue yeah. TVs. They reacted to the trailer, and then Thad stitched them all together. We shot I ourselves. Love that. We shot ourselves with our phones <laughs> reacting to the trailer as it was happening, all at the same time, annoying everyone around us. Uh, and then they edited on the flight, and then dropped the episode on the flight. Insane. Insane. <laughs> it's still that a fun thing to look back on. <laughs> um, uh, all right, let's dig into the whole event now. What is the the panel, the event, maybe the speed dating thing that you're most looking <laughs> forward to out of all of Star Wars Celebration? Well, I have a girlfriend, so not the speed dating <laughs> thing. Uh, the Mandalorian, the John Favreau produced mm. uh, TV series, the first live action Star Wars TV series for Disney Plus. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be broadcast online. Actually, probably by the time this is broadcast, we would know that. Mm. Um, but I, I think John Favreau, whenever he shows up at Comic Con or any con, he brings the goods. He brings the footage. I, I remember he was shooting Cowboys and Aliens. And I think he was like three weeks into shooting yeah. or something. He brought the first 20 minutes that. of the movie. I was in Hall H for that, yeah. So I expect he's going to bring like maybe a whole episode. What? I don't know. Like, wow. Maybe, I don't know. That, that, may, that might be a bad, like a out there prediction. But That would be, I, I think that would be one of my celebration dream come true scenarios mm-hmm. if I had to pick one. I'm just really looking forward to seeing absolutely anything from The Mandalorian, like anything at all, because we've seen the image. There, there's been some some quotes out there, but you don't really get a sense of what they're trying to achieve as far as like atmosphere and tone go until you actually see some footage. And I'm just curious to know if the look of the Mandalorian is going to look different from mm. the feature films that we have. Yeah, I'm excited too. I, I have a friend. How can you say this without getting into it? <laughs> I have a friend who's seen some stuff and says it'll blow your mind how incredible it is and that Favreau's dedication to the lore of Star Wars and also uh, creating something new uh, is you can see it very clearly when you see the when he releases the character images and maybe whatever I I doubt we'll get an episode maybe 15 20 minutes of it or something like that Uh, you'll see how his approach to the uh, project is how how uh, big of a fan he is and how much he wants to bring the love of Star Wars back even more uh, than JJ did when he did Force Awakens. Um, I'm looking forward to Jedi Fallen Order. I want to see what we get from that. You know, I would I, maybe I'm going out on a limb, but I haven't always been the biggest fan of the Star Wars games that have come out in this recent iteration. I don't think you're the only one. <laughs> well, there we go. This this one looks to be finally something we've been waiting for for like five years to see, and so I'm excited how they go about it. Plus, the campaign don't stand out. That's interesting mm. to me. What a different approach to pitching something like Star Wars. What do you think of that teaser image that they released with like that weird lightsaber? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what does that cool. mean? How, how far back are we going? Yeah. What is the mythology here? All of it is really I think exciting. it's supposed to take place after Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. I'm, I can't wait for that panel. I'm also supposed to go actually tonight and test out Vader Immortal. And oh, I am nice. super into that kind of stuff. I remember, I think it was Star Wars Celebration London that they had the, I forget what it's called now, the other VR game. And I've just never played a VR game where just like the interactivity and the use of a lightsaber felt so real to me. But then, it, of course, we brought Beat Sabers to the office, and that was a little bit of a different thing. I am the Beat Saber champion of the world. That is right, Frank. But I'm really curious to give that a shot as well. But I feel, I feel like I'm lacking right now because you guys have the inside scoop on so many things. So I'm going to tell you, there's a Collider Jedi Council panel, and you will not believe the crazy stuff that's going to happen at that <laughs> panel on Sunday. That's all I got for you. It's not cool tidbits like they have. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's also like a, there's, there's some Schmodown tri- uh, Star Wars trivia going on as well that you all should go and see if you're going to be there. That's going to be a lot of fun to go and see that live, see a bunch of uh, people. Oh, speed dating. Look, I have a girlfriend too, Peter, <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with trying this out and seeing uh, what this is all about. But who who are you going to go at, in as cosplay? Yeah, I should speed. cosplay as maybe Boba Fett yeah. so you can't see my face or even Django. Maybe I just carry my head on my shoulder. So I'm like, I don't know. There's a lot of things <laughs> you, you can You just tell her I had to do it for Collider. For Collider. It's, it's just a 
yeah. work thing. Yeah, I didn't go. I didn't. I threw away all the numbers, honey. I threw away all the numbers. I would never. I it, want I'm this curious. to happen so badly. I'm very curious to see how this would go about. Like, what are the questions? Like, what do they test your fandom as this goes along? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you don't know. Forget it. I don't want to date. You don't know this about this. Oh, I'm just excited. Or if like the wrong movie is your favorite movie. Yeah. It's like, all right, right, I'm getting up and going over to the next table. I really love works? Last Jedi. Get away from me. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, I, I don't know what's so making awesome. me more curious now. The speed dating or walking into the tattoo pavilion, which I've been talking oh, about for years. There's a tattoo pavilion? Yeah. There, there, there is, but you got to yeah. like book those before I know, you I know. Go. Oh, do you that's really? The, oh, okay. I think that's the only that thing sense. that has stopped me over the years from yeah. covering myself in tattoos is that the appointments are just not available. Yeah, my girlfriend last time was going to get BBA at tattooed, but like they were all like booked up. Like, really? Wow. Yeah, you have to like book that. There's a really it. cool mm. minimalist BB-8 design that's floating around on the Googles out there, and I, lo I love the minimalist design. I always yeah. said that if I did get a Star Wars tattoo, it would be the minimalist X-Wing. Wow. It's so cool. Yeah, it's so like cool. Like it's not going to happen this time, though, because I didn't make an appointment. All right. <laughs> we are going to jump into our next topic, but before we do that, I just want to remind you, keep an eye on the Collider Video YouTube channel and also Collider.com because you are going to get slammed with so much Star Wars celebration information over the next couple of days. Hope you enjoy it all. All right. This next story here is a bit of a big one, and it's about Avengers Endgame. So there's a couple of little tidbits we want to hit here. First up, some quotes from Mark Ruffalo that he gave during an interview with E! News. So we know that they try to throw people off with not revealing full scripts and things like that, so nobody reveals the ending. But apparently, Mark Ruffalo gave away one of, I think there were five fake endings or something of the sort. Here's the quote that Mark Ruffalo gave. I shot like five different at a whole script of this movie. I don't know why the script I did get had dummy scenes in it. He then points to Chris Evans and says he gets married in this. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when, when he actually says this, he could have said like, as in, you know, there was just a bunch of endings. We don't know if there's specifically five, but apparently they did shoot something. And then on top of that, we also know that Avengers Endgame runs at a little over three hours. And usually what happens is you get a director's cut for a movie and that cut is usually longer than the final cut in this particular case that wasn't true. Steve was recently talking to the Russo brothers at the Avengers Endgame uh, press day, and here is what they told him. We've been working on this movie for well over a year in editorial because we finished it in 2018, and it literally hasn't moved maybe more than two minutes from its original runtime on the director's cut. It's just a tough one. There's just a lot of story in it. We like emotional stakes that require screen time. We have almost everything in this movie that we shot. I think our first cut was slightly shorter than this. Okay, first I want to back up to those extra scenes, those those mysterious fake endings, because, you know, the footage costs a crazy amount of money. So, Peter, can you give us any insight into would they actually or is this almost just like a figure of speech here? Surprisingly, this is actually real. I, I, I've heard about some of these scenes. I don't know what is real, what's not. <laughs> but let's give you a theoretical example. Say you were filming that wedding scene. With uh, you could have everybody together in a church for a wedding scene, but it could also be a funeral scene. So like you could in in one mm. day film two different scenes, two drastically different endings. Good point. Which one are they using? Yeah, that is fascinating. Yeah. It's just fascinating that they would go to those lengths to preserve the secrets. But when you have people like Mr. Mark Ruffalo who say things uh, on accident sometimes and reveal details, <laughs> I guess that's why he's in this position in particular. Roka, what do you make mm. of the idea of the director's cut being shorter than the full feature? I don't think I've ever heard that before in my entire life with any kind of thing. So this is exciting to me on so many levels because it means like they realized even their original cut wasn't enough to get fully to where they wanted to get to. So they added some more footage to it, making it longer. That when do you hear a director's cut being, sh uh, you know, necessarily like shorter than the uh, original cut that you end up with? That's kind of rare. So I'm excited to see what that means. Uh, how much more scenes we get? And going back to this, the idea of shooting. I mean, they make they make so much money. What's the problem with shooting a few fake scenes? And it's probably fun for everybody involved. And you don't know what is going to be the truth. That's a great point you bring up. A, a wedding could be a funeral. Yeah. 
is the Cap's funeral on the right that what we're everybody's like afraid is going to happen? Cap's death, and then uh, Rhodey, uh, I mean uh, uh, Falcon saying on, on the right or turn right, and then everyone breaks down and cries. So, and, and by the way, this isn't just to fool the actors. There's right. hundreds, there's yeah. hundreds yeah. of people of on course. that set, production staff. Yeah, yeah, they they want to keep it lock and yeah. key, you know, with them. Because Tom Holland is good. If, if your premier actors are spilling stuff, <laughs> what are the people below the line going to do in well, conversation and parties at bars or what have you? Fortunately, yeah. this time around they have a reasonable excuse to keep him out of the marketing yeah, uh, true, material true. or at least the interviews where <laughs> certain things can be spoiled. I also wanted to add a little bit that they said about deleted scenes. So at the point that Steve did this interview they hadn't gone into editorial to assess all the cut footage just yet but they estimated the length of deleted scenes will run closer to five minutes rather than ten so not very much here. I just suspect that because recently we had reported that um, they they had the ending of Endgame like long, long ago when they started working on Infinity War. So I just imagine that knowing the ending and having a clear idea of what that ending is for so long and having gone through that process with Infinity War, mm. I don't know. If they wound up with the director's cut at, well after they were fully locked and loaded with Infinity War, I guess it doesn't really surprise me that it was just about maybe beefing up little character moments here or there. I question if, if they have an ending already mapped out, you know, do how have they adjusted how they get there? That's the thing also to look at. Have they made any changes to get to that ending, or has that ending adjusted a little bit as they've gone along and and seen fans' reaction to certain things? Hmm. I wonder. You know, I mean, you could have everything mapped out ahead of time, but you just never know what fans are going to react to or not react to, and what storylines are going to present themselves, or what interactions may give you ideas for other things as you move along. You still may end up with that ending, but I wonder how the process uh, was like getting there. Somewhere twenty years from now. There's an incredible book about how the Russos did all of this with all the help of the directors and, of course, Kevin Feige and with MCU. But it, it's exciting that they knew ahead of time to let you know that they knew they were telling a way larger story than people might have given them credit for. And it should be said, too, that uh, Marvel doesn't like people seeing stuff that wasn't supposed to, or didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there, there's been a lot of stuff shot over the years that we have not seen in deleted scenes. And I, I know originally Smart... Uh, Banner was supposed to become Smart Hulk right. in Infinity War, and that was shot. We didn't get that right, mm -hmm. so um, presumably he'll probably become that in this film. Hopefully, maybe. A lot of people say um, that's the rumor that when they're walking yeah. and there's that space, that it's him as Smart Hulk that they're saving to show in the movie. Yeah. Can you imagine how much money they would make if after all is said and done with the MCU, like they officially closed the book, if then they had a screening and it was just a whole string of these these deleted scenes, oh, wow. maybe the fake endings. I mean, I would pay good money to see that kind of stuff. I really agree. I don't know why they're not making like a special edition like Peter Jackson style. Like I would watch the like eight hour Infinity Wars like special edition cut. I, I kind of think I would too. Yeah. I mean, it's probably only a matter of time. I mean, yeah. actually, now that I say that, it's just like Endgame and then soon after is far from home. And I feel like that would be the gap mm, to actually yeah. do something like that. And they haven't announced any plans to give it a shot, but yeah. they just have so much content at this point. I think that uh, there is going to come a time where as much as we want everything and anything MCU, like how, how, much, how much can our brains handle and how many hours in the day are there? Because not only do we have the continuous of the MCU after Endgame, but our next story here is also focusing on the wealth of series we're going to get on Disney Plus. So keep in mind, this was a pre-taped episode of Movie Talk. There is a shareholders call early this morning, so there could be some additional updates that you're not going to get in this discussion. Right now, we are focusing strictly on the shows that are confirmed and then semi-confirmed, and we're going to speculate a little bit about what that means for Avengers Endgame and what could happen in the movie. So, right off the bat, I'm going to give you a heads up on a potential spoiler warning, because what kicked off this conversation was the announcement of the Hawkeye series, and and there is a little bit of a synopsis here that you might consider a spoiler, so you have been warned. Here it goes. The report came from Variety, and they're saying that Jeremy Renner is set to reprise his role in a Hawkeye series. Here is the plot that they shared. As Variety has it, the adventure series sees Barton passing the torch to Kate Bishop, a Marvel Comics character who eventually took up the mantle of Hawkeye and was part of the superhero team, Young Avengers. In addition to that, 
Shows that have been reported by the trades but yet to be confirmed by Marvel include the Scarlet Witch and Vision show and also the Winter Soldier and Falcon show. And the only show to have been officially confirmed by Marvel at this point is the Loki show. So, oh man. What This is like the biggest question I could imagine, but what do you guys think that the announcement of these particular shows with these specific characters means for what could happen at the end of Endgame? Well, I, I do think, um, you know, Patrick H. Willems did this fantastic video essay recently about the, the problems with the MCU, and I highly recommend you go out and try to find that. And one of them he, he mentioned is the illusion of change, that mm. every film we see these big things happen that dramatically change the, the universe, and then the next film, they're kind of retconned. Mm -hmm. And I, we don't know what's going to happen in Endgame, but I assume a lot of these people that were dusted are going to be returned. <laughs> and what the comics have that the films don't have, as he mentions, I feel like I'm just stealing his content here, but is they have all these issues in between, these big events. And we're just getting the big events, and we're not getting the issues in between. And these shows are going to provide us with, mm -hmm. like, these kind of store, like give, mm -hmm. give us time to actually live with these characters and these changes. And I feel like that's going to be what's kind of exciting. We don't know when these, when these uh, stories are, take place, like Loki's dead, right? And uh, that could take place in different timelines, you know. <laughs> so what are, you, what are your thoughts? Or is he? Is he dead? I don't know. Uh, this excites me on so many levels because uh, Kevin Feige says, Kevin Feige himself said, this is going to open more avenues for us to tell more storytelling with these characters, right? The Kate Bishop stuff, yes, hand the mantle. Well, Kate Bishop and Clint Barton have a very complicated relationship in the comics. He, uh, in, depending on which run you read, he tests Kate before he lets Kate take on the mantle of being Hawkeye. Other ones, he trains Kate. So there's a lot to be involved here that can explore. I don't know how much Jeremy Renner will be involved in that, but it's smart to go the Kate Bishop route. There's a lot to explore. Do you open now, which, which a lot of people have been clamoring for for the last few years, the Young Avengers, Hulkling, Patriot. A lot of people want to dance around with the Young Avengers as well. Is Kate Bishop the first like trial balloon they're throwing up to see how people react to it to open the door there? I think what you make, uh, I think what I you said, Peter, do the, the Matt Fraction. That's the, uh, oh my God, that's yeah. the one. If you haven't read, if you don't know what Kate Bishop is or Hawkeye, you don't know that much, yeah. read the Matt Fraction graphic novel. That will tell you everything you need to know. Fantastic stuff. But what you said, Peter, is a good point too. These are all filling, in, these series could fill in the holes and filling in those holes offer the opportunity for other storylines to blossom out of it. I don't know what we got with Loki Perry because he's dusted. Is he going to come back now? Because Dennis Zhang will be super mad if Loki well, comes back. Well, he's not dusted. He was dead before the dust. Well, dead, yeah, right. Right. It, it, is and I think so? the screenwriters of Infinity War said at one point that everybody that dies yeah, right. in Die. Infinity War yeah. is dead. I remember having that discussion. I, it, it but is also the crazy Russos lied to, to us about the, the exactly. Title, so. Well, they lied to they lie to us in the marketing material yeah. and then admit to lying to to us in the marketing mm -hmm. material. So I never even know what to trust. And I mean, to be completely honest, I have really uh, I have a wonderful time having my brain just like spin out of control trying to figure this out, which is why I'm going in a different direction. And I can already like refute the statement I'm about to make for a variety of reasons. But given the fact that all of these shows have something to do with, well, I, now I'm already looking at names that don't fit my damn theory. Oh, I'm never going to win. I do think we're going to end up at a point where there are two different dimensions happening at the same time, where a whole bunch of the dusted characters come back and they wind up being, you know, the MCU 2.0 or whatever the next phase is, whatever they're going to call it. And then is the that other- how you could introduce the X-Men? They're in a, the other oh. dimension? That's, yeah, that's part mm. of the reason. And I, I think that they're all going to wind up in like a new place where something like that could have existed. And then you take these characters that are moving over to Disney Plus, and then you give them, basically you blow the creative doors wide open and have them do something completely different mm. that isn't, it's connected, but it's not connected in the same traditional way we've seen before. And that way you could play around with all different possibilities that we'd never considered for these same characters that we've already grown to love. They're already super fleshed out, but you put them in these like alternate type of scenarios yeah. and you learn more about them. Did I, I sell you? I, I'm, I'm, I'm down on this. I'm down. Yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely down with that. I, then I and started actually, to look at the list though, and I'm like, well, but like Scarlet Witch and, and Falcon, like it doesn't all line up. And one well. of the shows you don't men mention there is a story that uh, we broke on SlashFilm.com. They're doing a what if animated mm. series, right, right, right. which isn't part of the yes. MCU, but it is kind of because they're using the MCU as like 
the the background mm-hmm. for it. So that we're going to get to see, like, you know, what if Loki got the hammer instead of Thor and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I think that could be really interesting as well, but that doesn't fit. We that. covered that. Well, I yeah. love that idea. I mean, I just love the idea of, you know, I greatly appreciate MCU continuity, and I know it's not perfectly <laughs> ironed out, but it really is kind of incredible when you think about how many years worth of films that have all come together and we're so invested in. But I love the idea of turning things kind of on its head and exploring this in a whole new way. Do you guys think that this list of shows we have right here that we've already gone over is going to be it for maybe the first wave of announcements? Or do you anticipate them announcing another character getting a show in the near future? We were talking off camera. I would love to see the Dora Milaje uh, get their own show. Um, because, like, look at the... There's not a lot of diversity in the characters they've chosen. So, you know, Black Panther was introduced to do... To kind of put some more diversity back in the MCU. And I would love to see something with the Dora Milaje. Who came out of that Black Panther film as one of the top three or four things you are excited about to see more in the future. See, the problem is I think they're making too much money on those Black Panther films for them to put it on TV. (laughs) But I've been saying since I saw Black Panther that I would like to see a Wakanda series that takes place kind of on the ground level of Wakanda. So we Mm. we hear about the royalty and we hear about, you know, them in, in passing, but it's about like the struggles of actually the people. Of so the pe- people of Wakanda, yeah. the citizens, like uh, through their perspective, what it's like to yeah, live in Wakanda. It might not even be a superhero movie, yeah. uh, like show. Do you know sure. what I mean? It's just a, a show about like a different nation that is a fictional nation in the MCU. Oh. So working with my theory, yeah. I'm putting Black Panther in the big screen realm. I want everything you guys are saying right now, but I'm not going to include it because I think it's going to stay cinematic. When I go over to the TV side, though, I start to think that at least one of the major Guardians that we think could come mm. back from Guardians uh, for Guardians 3 is not going to come back, and that individual is going to get their own show on Disney+, Plus, and that's how mm. they add in the cosmic element on Disney+. Plus. Because mm. we don't have, I don't think we, well, we have it with Loki, I guess, but a little so, more. Who would that be, Drax? <sighs> I don't, I don't necessarily. I think Drax is pulling up too big. To, I mean, yeah. I, I think, think yeah, just, uh, I think Drax is probably, yeah, I think Drax is coming back to the big screen, and I would never want to separate him and Mantis, so she's coming back as well. I wonder if they can do something with Gamora and Nebula, maybe, because mm. I, I also don't want this to be the end of Nebula. Okay. What if you did it as a prequel, seeing them as Thanos's daughters, like kind of this yes. feuding, like family kind of thing? I am sold. That works. That I, that no, I, like I would that not mind seeing, yeah. yeah. It kind of has that human element, so to speak, for lack of a better term, yeah. but also the superhero aspect of yeah. it is still in play the whole time. Yeah. The thing I'm worried about it, it, with these shows is that it will become too much like the the Star Wars Expanded Universe did, where mm. it's kind of like all these prequels and stuff that like we're not really affecting what's happening in the movies because it's easier that way. Couldn't you do a Groot Racco- Rocket Raccoon one? Because you could just get someone who could do... They a, have to come back. Well, right. They have Groot, to Groot would back. have to come back. Rocket's already... <laughs> but like you could have Rocket and Groot together in, in their adventures. That'd be fun um, as well. And you, you, you wouldn't necessarily have to have Bradley Cooper. And yeah. There are plenty of voice actors who could come close to approximating uh, Rocket's voice or Groot's voice. But the, but they're having the voice actors come in for yeah. those what-if Well, this is, so thing like, that, yeah. this is what's fascinating you, to me. voice acting, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, you come in for... I, mean, I don't want to yeah, make it... It's sound great easy money. It's great money, no. But it's not like the amount of hours hours that no. you get for a live action thing. Exactly. You're done mm-hmm. in three or four hours. You, the, the regulations don't let you go past three or four hours for doing that kind of work. The thing that's interesting to me, though, and Perry, this is something you, uh, to connect back to what you talked about, shooting these uh, fake scenes, they're spending a lot of money. This is high-end <laughs> talent to bring in to do these streaming shows on Disney+. Plus. It's pretty surprising how much they're willing to spend and how much these actors are willing to keep doing these characters for Marvel. I, I find it fascinating. Remember, it was, like, what, 20 years ago, uh, or maybe, 30, I guess, 30 years ago, I'm dating myself, where Michael <laughs> Keaton said he didn't want to do a third Batman. Now these people are running back to do these characters over and over again. Mm-hmm. I think it's an incredible change in the perception of superhero films. As far as the connectivity goes between the Disney Plus shows and the mm-hmm. MCU, I just wanted to bring back one previous quote that Kevin Feige gave. He said, it's been extremely additive to the entire creative arc, not just to the Disney Plus programs we, we are working on, but on the entire endgame, on the entire post-endgame MCU, because 
because we've been able to weave them. We've been able to, for the first time, conceive of them together and they will be intertwined with each other. I see two different angles being played there where he like specifically focuses on post endgame, but then the interweaving. And I don't necessarily think the interweaving is where he means it like, you know how Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was basically completely separate. I don't think he means it like we would have interwoven the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. into like the active present MCU as we know yeah. it. We'll see. We'll see. Feige <laughs> has that like reality distortion feel that like Steve Jobs had. Before. <laughs> like he really does. Like anything he says, like it sounds like it's saying something, and then you read it and you're and like, like, what no. is he saying? <laughs> I mean, he has to be a master at this if he's yeah. gonna keep it all secret. I still can't believe we have two weeks to go until we see the movie, and it's like all of maybe not all of these questions, but many of these things we've been guessing on for a long, long time now are answered. We have one more quick story to hit today, and it's a brand new trailer for a documentary. So we all know that we're getting scary stories to tell in the dark later this summer but if you're a big fan of the source material you have a documentary to look forward to it's just called scary stories and the doc not only explores the history of the three volume book series that scared kids in the 80s and 90s and includes interviews with kids horror authors like rl stein it also dips into the cultural impact that the tomes had as scary stories did become one of the top band titles in the united states States. This one debuts in select theaters beginning April 26th. Roka, did you read Scary Stories? I think I remember reading Scary Stories. I'm old enough to maybe have read them, but I lived in a place where we didn't have that kind of, in the trailer alludes to the censorship or trying mm -hmm. to ban those books. We, I was allowed to walk down to my library, local library, and rent books and bring them back and read, but I was into Stephen King things very early on. Like, at nine, ten years old, I was reading Stephen King or Edgar Allan Poe, and I had a fascination for that kind of, more of the psychological horror than the overt stuff. So I, I'm sure I must have read that at some point, but it didn't stick in my mind as the other uh, things did for me. I'm surprised I didn't have this in my life as a kid no. because this is the type of stuff that was made for who I was mm. growing up. I think my brain was pretty much just like completely consumed by goosebumps. I was a I had goosebumps. Right. I was yeah. very, very into goosebumps. I think I brought Say Cheese and Die to Sleepaway Camp like every single summer. <laughs> I must have read that book 20 times over, but I am very into just like basically the the highlighting of scary stories right now because I went to that event with Haley a little mm. while back where they screened some footage for the new Andre Overdahl movie that Guillermo del Toro produced and I don't think I ever really realized how like gigantic that fan base is and how passionate that fan base is until I was standing in a room surrounded by so many of them. I was in the room more as just, you know, a horror lover that finds it really exciting to be able to celebrate these movies with some younger kids out mm. there. But there were a lot of people in the audience who knew every little detail. So I think it's a genius move to give us this documentary a couple of months before the movie comes out. Yeah, I'm totally going to watch this. This is something because I, I know nothing. I, I only know about these books from writing about the movie on, on the side, and I really know very little compared to even you who didn't grow up with. It, it looks yeah. good. Yeah. That, mm. that movie looked pretty good. Yeah. I was surprised that they, they pushed it as far as they seem to in the trailer, as far as just like really eerie creature design goes. The scene yeah. that we saw that they screened there, it definitely had, you know, like a little bit of a childish feel where someone like me is not going to be terrified and not going to, you know, check under my bed because of what I just saw, but it's, you know, it's it's got some real energy to it, and there are certain lines that were repeated too. If you know the Big Toe story, I actually have read that one. It's just I could hear my cousins like repeating it in the scary voice, and that's what gets me excited more so than anything. But this documentary is on my radar. I plan on watching it. I assume you guys will as yes. well. Who's got Sweet. my scary toe? <laughs> I feel is that like, what it is? I feel like you should. Yeah, like who's got Nobody. my big toe? Who's got my big toe? <laughs> You've got it. I remember that. Yeah. We, should, we right. should totally do a dramatic reading of some of these scary yeah, stories sure. before the movie comes I'm down. out. I, I would love be those totally things. down for that as well. <laughs> all right. Now is the time of the show where I get to tell you about all the content you have to look forward to on Collider Video and beyond. Oh, this first one. How convenient. Roca, yeah. tell us about sports time. Oh, yeah. We had a, we dro we're dropping a sports time on Friday. Mark Fernandez is stopping by to talk with us about the Lakers situation with Magic Johnson. We also talk about what kind of 
rehash the uh, national title game. And we get into a little NHL playoffs preview with Josh McCuga breaking it down. You know he's a massive puckhead. So this is a fun, fun episode. And trust me, we didn't hold back on the Magic Johnson Lakers LeBron situation. That's a half an hour segment of the show at least. And even though you're heading off to <clears throat> Chicago, you did tape some mailbag for yeah. the weekend. Yeah, some mailbags. I got Dennis Zang and Wendy Lee stopping by. Uh, they're both massive Game of Thrones fans. So we these both of these episodes are a little Game of Thrones themed, shall we say. And so there's fun questions answered there for both of them. They were great. You're going to enjoy those. Uh, you can watch them uh, Saturday and the Sun. Saturday is Dennis Zeng. Wendy, uh, Sunday will be Wendy Lee. That'll be a lot of fun uh, there. Speaking of Dennis, another thing to keep an eye out for is the Collider Games podcast. You can check that out as well. Even though we're not live with you right now, I did pre-pick a couple of Twitter questions. Sadly, we only have time for one, but it's a good one, I promise. Actually, Peter, I think this is going to be a good one for you to weigh in on. Sean Wren wrote to us, if you're Disney, how would you separate news and footage with Star Wars Celebration, San Diego Comic-Con in July and D23 in August. Will D23 be all about Disney Plus so they'll get all the trailers and first looks when it comes to Marvel and Star Wars? Will SDCC be just about Phase 4 or will it be at D23? I don't know why I look at you and I think you're just like a D... Yeah, I mean, you really are. You're like a Disney uh, oh, yeah. every single vertical pro. Yeah, if, if, if I was not writing about movies in Disney, I would be at D23 waiting in <laughs> those long lines. Um, I I think Feige is coming to Comic-Con with something. I don't know what... I, it, it's really tough because like D23, when it first started, there was like this, you know... Uh, live action panel and there was an animation mm -hmm. panel. Mm -hmm. I remember and now that. they've grown to like four hours long each or something. It feels like that at least. Now they have Fox and now they have Marvel and Star Wars and all the stuff. I don't know how you fit all the, and Disney Plus. I don't know how you fit all that in. I think you have to use all those conventions and I don't know why there isn't a Marvel con. Like, yeah. If they're doing Star Wars Celebration and D23, they, they should be pushing a Marvel con. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. question. I, well, I guess because it's all under the window, so they're just going to, or under the umbrella, rather, so they're just going to drop what they say. I think what Sean laid it out sounds about right to me. Disney Plus for the D23 stuff, that makes a lot of sense. Disney related, connected, face stuff for SDCC, a lot of the heroes, superheroes, feature film stuff, and then Star Wars Celebration, just Star Wars, obviously. So I think that's how they're going to go. It's, it sounds about, yeah. and it sounds like it makes sense to me. And the live action stuff for Disney as well in D23. See, I I can't tell if this is just my want to keep everything neat and organized brain kicking in right now, <laughs> but I, I do think they have Star Wars Celebration, so obviously that is Star Wars. Then I think that San Diego Comic-Con for them, if not a Marvel Con, because I do believe that is in the not-too-distant future right yeah. now, I think that Comic-Con is going to be for superheroes, period. So the MCU, the Cinematic Universe, and also these Disney Plus shows, because mm. then when you hit D23, not only do they need need that precious stage time to pump their animated fare, their live action uh, adaptations, but now they also have some Fox brands like Avatar. They've got to start right. pumping Avatar. Oh, so yeah, Avatar. I just have a feeling like it, I know. <laughs> I forgot that was even it's coming. It's crazy to me that that is I mean, most people that I speak to have a very similar reaction. I'm not saying there's no Avatar fans out there, but it's crazy to me that that's the tone of the conversation right now. Mm. And then all of a sudden, there's going to come They're a time where something's going to change. Yeah. I was looking at the worldwide box office this weekend, like on my phone, and like there's nothing even close to Avatar. No, isn't it and, crazy? And all these people making fun of those Avatar sequels, including us here, yeah. are going to see it, and they're going to see it probably multiple times, and it's, it's probably going to break records. That first trailer is going to matter. That first trailer is going to bring everybody back to it. it they got to kick i think they have to knock it out of the park in that first show because it's been so long i i think that's because people are waiting to be wowed it's like the joker movie everybody made fun of the joker movie now everyone's in that camp <laughs> yeah you yeah. just need to see it but you don't think jj is going to show up at uh at, at comic-con to, to show us something you think it's just for episode star nine. wars celebration. for episode nine no i think it's just star wars celebration mm. i do mm. i think they're gonna they're gonna keep it to that and that said even though when there was um i mean the the outdoor concert thing was for force awakens, force awakens. Yeah, force yeah. Awakens, yeah with the lightsabers and i stuff don't know here. i mean maybe it is fair game for them to show up there with with more of like just uh just like a satellite event type thing but i feel like they have so much to promote at this point that 
they need they need the spotlight to be focused on one thing instead of diverting our attention in five million directions. Mm-hmm. Because let's say they go let's say they go there hypothetically with Star Wars and Marvel. Then all of a sudden, two of their biggest brands are fighting for the spotlight against each other. Whereas if Marvel shows up there with all of their MCU movies and the Disney Plus stuff, nothing can touch it. <laughs> But this is the problem they're going to have for the, ne- of the foreseeable future. When I was at CinemaCon last week, they they came on stage and they showed this timeline of the next year of mm-hmm. Disney things. And then they added Fox into the mix. And it was mm-hmm. like a jumble. It looked like one of those things where you threw like 100 things at a board and they just stuck there. Like they're overlapping. And I don't know how you, how you give equal treatment to all these things. I have absolutely no clue. I think that's why we have Disney Theatrical, Disney Plus, Hulu, and who knows where everything else is going to land. There's a lot of content. I mean, that's the bright side is yeah. there's a lot of content and that is very exciting. Yeah. Hopefully it's all at a certain level or above, but I just love the idea that we have so much to work with and so much to get excited about right yeah. now. Did they have Logan talking to Black Panther or that thing? There was rumors that Logan was talking no, to Black no, no, Panther no. in the Sizzle Reel. It was just like a montage. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All, right, all right. I heard rumors. I heard rumors. I'm just All saying. right. Only time will tell, and we can bet you that we're going to be covering it all. Every single step of the way, four days a week, right here on Collider Movie Talk. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you tell our, all of our viewers where to find your work and you on social media? Yes, uh, go to SlashFilm.com. It's a movie blog, and I do a daily news movie podcast called Slash Film Daily, which you can find on any of your podcast apps. Highly recommended. Check yep. it out. Roka, throw in some plugs there. Where can people follow you during Star Wars Celebration? Well, you, if you're watching this, uh, maybe you can come see us live tonight. When, they, when this drops, we're doing it at Reggie's Live. we still got a few tickets left there. Top 10 show. Me and Matt Nose doing our thing there. We've got two shows at 7 and 10 p.m. doing it live for you guys. Two different lists. I do want to say one thing, though. Peter, this has been an honor to be on the stage set with you because the first junket I ever did years ago you were at Pixar yeah Pixar you were incredibly kind to me and you walked me through something I was so nervous didn't know where to go Peter Eric uh, Eric Eisenberg a couple people they really walked me through this thing so I can't thank you enough for that so it's nice to kind of do a show with you man Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that was so sweet. You missed a very important plug for yourself, oh, though. If you're participating in Star Wars Celebration speed dating and you catch someone <laughs> in a Boba Fett mask, it's that guy right there. Cody, thank you so much for helping us out today. We really appreciate it. Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. As always, like and share it. Also, tell everybody you know about the show in podcast form as well. Keep an eye out for so much Star Wars Celebration coverage. And then we will be back in L.A. Monday, 4 p.m. PT, live with a brand new episode.